everyone, and welcome to today's episode. I am really excited to be joined today by Holly Tuppen, who is a freelance writer and responsible travel expert. She has specialized in sustainable travel since she circumnavigated the world without flying in 2010, which sounds pretty cool. She's a former editor of Green Hotelier and communications man- manager for the International Tourism Partnership. And now she writes for The Guardian and Condé Nast Traveler, as well as helping travel companies and hotels to have a more positive impact as a consultant. She's also communication manager for conservation-led travel organization, The Long Run. And she just wrote her first book called Sustainable Travel, The Essential Guide to Positive Impact Adventures. Welcome to the show, Holly. Hi, so nice to meet you. I'm so excited to have you here because I love to travel. I actually used to travel a lot pre-COVID, um, both for fun and for business. And I've been a homebody now for the last year. So when I saw the topic of your book, I was really excited because I know that there are definitely some travel choices that are more green than others, more eco-friendly than others. So let's just start with a simple definition of your title. What exactly does sustainable travel mean? Okay, well, it's a big, it's a big topic and it's been um, hotly debated over the last um, 18 months during COVID. Obviously, people haven't been able to travel and there's been lots of um, travel businesses um, and commentators without anything to uh, go and experience. So I feel like there's been a lot of talk, um, which is really good because I think it's it's picked the whole travel industry up and people have maybe had some of the debates that we wouldn't have necessarily had if everyone had just carried on traveling. Sometimes it's amazing, isn't it? You kind of need that pause to kind of move a conversation on. Um, so yeah, so sustainable travel. So the kind of one of the first points I really make in the book is that for years, sustainable travel was all about having less of an impact on the world. So it was trying to kind of minimize our environmental impact um, and kind of carbon footprint and things like that. Um, but I think over the last few years, since issues like um, over tourism, where there are places that are getting too many tourists that kind of cities and national parks can't handle them um, have bubbled up to the surface. Um, If we're moving into a kind of dialogue around um, sustainable travel needs to be more regenerative. um, It needs to be transformative. It needs to have a very positive impact on both people and places. Um, So I think a really good starting point is to just think about our traveling that, um, it's it suits the destination as much as it suits us as holiday goers so um really when you think about kind of what you teach your kids or um whoever you teach when you're teaching like how to be a nice person um it's to kind of put others before yourself isn't it and to kind of try and look at things from all sides and I think this is the same as that sustainable travel is not just kind of jumping on the first holiday that comes your way and and not thinking about um who it's impacting, where it's impacting, and how we can travel to really make sure we're having a positive rather than a negative impact. That's a really great way to put it. So um, one of the things that I think some people may immediately think about is, oh, well, I stayed at that hotel that talked about um, doing carbon offsets um, and things like that, which to me, that just kind of, I don't know, that has never really felt like I was doing anything that awesome. It kind of seemed like a marketing thing. Um, yeah. is, is that something that is good or no? Yeah, well, it's really tricky. I think, yeah, carbon offsetting has obviously been around a long time and um, there was a massive boom in the industry, I think probably about um, five years ago, where it just started to make so, so much money that people started to think like, well, hang on a minute, where's all this money going? And is this really the right approach? Um, So, I mean, I think going back to the like analogy of like how you're a good person in life, I guess you don't kind of slap someone in the face and then say sorry, like repeatedly over and over again, which in some ways is what carbon offsetting is. It's kind of saying, well, I can go and do whatever I want because I can pay to justify it. We wouldn't really act like that, I think, in any other area of of life. So I do think, you know, it's definitely not the solution. Um, We can't all rely on carbon offsetting. Um, 
to kind of combat the climate crisis that we're in at the moment. That said, um, there are lots of parts of the travel industry that are really kind of desperately struggling with trying to have as positive an impact as they possibly can. And um, aviation is the kind of massive elephant in the room in terms of carbon, because we don't yet have the technology to fly without burning huge amounts of, of carbon. So, um, so you know, for, for lots of travel companies, they do offset flights because, you know, that's the only way they can see that they can at least be doing something. And I can totally um, sympathize with that approach. So I think it's a balancing act. I think at the moment, the danger is, is that everyone's saying it's we're, we're carbon zero or we're carbon positive and or we're carbon neutral. Um, you know, everyone from kind of hotel chains to burger joints to aviation companies. And actually, when you drill down to some of that, you're like, well, if you haven't changed your behavior at all as a business and all you've done is pay for someone else to plant trees, often the carbon calculations that are used are quite false and actually the amount of planting trees doesn't necessarily absorb the carbon that we need to. Um, yeah, I think we all need to kind of scrutinize some of those claims a little bit more. Yeah. So since you mentioned flying and since you have circumnavigated the globe without flying, um, that is something I'd love to hear more about. So how on earth did you manage to circumnavigate the globe without flying? What did you do for transportation? Yeah, so um, it was really amazing and I would definitely recommend it to anyone. Um, I mean, at the moment, I can imagine it'd be hugely challenging to circumnavigate the world. So it's pretty hard to go places flying at the moment, let alone not flying. But uh, as, as adventures go, the reason we, we decided to do that was that we just wanted a true adventure. Like we wanted to find ourselves in situations that were challenging, both mentally and physically. We wanted to be... Um, when you travel overland, you kind of end up in places that you would never choose to go to. Um, so kind of border towns or in China, kind of in the middle of the desert and kind of out towards um, Kashgar and places that we probably wouldn't have gone to unless we had to kind of carve a route through. Um, so that's kind of why we did it. And in terms of transport, we had a tandem bicycle because it was with my boyfriend at the time. So we had a tandem bicycle that we cycled um quite a lot including up the states which was definitely one of our most memorable legs of the trip so we picked it up in El Paso and we cycled up to Vancouver um up the Rockies so and as you can imagine two English people on a tandem bicycle in places like Utah and Colorado we got uh, an equal amount of um kind of trucker beeps and hollers to kind of people welcoming us into their homes with open arms just thinking this was the weirdest and best thing they've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> so um so yeah we did a lot of cycling we did um there's something called crew seekers where you can advertise that you're up for kind of crewing a sailing boat um so we hopped on a sailing boat across the atlantic um you can actually book rooms on container ships that are taking freight across oceans so we we went from vancouver to south korea on a big container ship um and in between we just did loads of kind of uh, hitchhiking buses, trains. Um, we walked a bit of the Camino de Santiago in Spain. Um, and yeah, it was great. I really missed that kind of travel where you don't really know where you're going or where you're going to end up or <laughs> whose house you're going to be kind of welcomed into and having dinner or staying the night at. That to me is the best kind of travel. That does sound like a huge adventure, like it, nothing that anyone else could even compare. And I loved it that you mentioned container ships as a way to travel in your book. When I saw that, I was like, what? Container ships? <laughs> um, it never occurred to me that that was even possible. And you mentioned the travel agents who can book you on container ships. And I would imagine, because um, back when my husband was in the Navy, we heard that we could fly for free um, on Navy planes. And so we did that once. And so we flew on a cargo plane. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> you know, instead of, so when you go to get on a cargo plane, like instead of, you know, having food and stuff like that, you get handed a pair of earplugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and you're sitting in a jump seat and it is nothing like what you have ever <laughs> seen before on an airplane. So I would imagine that being on a container ship is nothing like being on a cruise ship. What were the accommodations like? 
Yeah, so it's funny you say that. And that is, and we did do a fair bit of kind of uh, hopping around on quite industrial boats when we were in the Caribbean. And I have to say, you're in pretty sweaty uh, kind of engine rooms and things. But on these container ships that you book onto, you have an amazing setup. Like you've got your own suite with like a bathroom and a living room and a bedroom. Um, you're you're treated like the captain. So these boats are often divided into like captain and crew. And so you're welcome into the captain's mess where you have your three course meals at every single meal time. Um, you're also allowed up on the bridge. So you can go up onto the bridge where all the captains are um, kind of doing all their important chipping stuff that they do. Um, you can go up there and um, look out from there whenever you want. You've kind of got free reign of the boat. It's it's kind of ridiculous. Um, we also the the crew on our boat was Filipino, and as you as you might know, the Filipinos love karaoke. So we were also welcomed into the Filipino crew karaoke room, which was a good contrast from the uh, the German officers in the uh, captain's room. Um, so yeah, it was. Um, it's kind of not what you imagine. It's it's totally. No. It's just bonkers. Um, yeah. And actually seeing the ocean from those boats and those shipping routes and kind of getting a little bit of an understanding of how all those shipping routes work is also an amazing insight because it's such a huge part of how the globe operates. And yet it's this totally different world that we don't often, well, why would we ever dip into it? So, yeah, it definitely felt like a privilege to experience a bit of that. Wow. So I know they talk a lot about on cruise ships that they've got baffles and stuff that make them less likely to cause seasickness. Since a container ship is mostly for containers, mm. I would think they probably don't have that. So this would not be something good for somebody who's prone to seasickness. Probably not. <laughs> no, I remember it getting pretty, uh, I think we were going past the Aleutian Islands and it was pretty rolly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we had our sea legs by them because we'd done a fair bit of sailing. So, okay. <laughs> all right. So that's a good to, I was like almost sold and then like, oh my goodness, I've got to go to one of these agents who books you on there. And then I started thinking about the seasickness part of it, um, it might not be a good thing for me. <laughs> Maybe try and cure your seasickness and then booking. So it would be a shame to miss out. Yeah. And it's quite cool. It's quite cool to cross an ocean. Like it's a good thing to do in life. <laughs> yeah it really does sound like something to put on your bucket list yeah um so in terms of where to travel then you mentioned briefly in the beginning about over tourism in some places it's it's super obvious like Machu Picchu you know if you just look that up I mean the people are just like sardines in this outdoor place <laughs> Um, I heard about that a couple of years ago and it was just so sad to mm -hmm. just see like these thousands and thousands of people who go there every single day mm -hmm. and Mount Everest. Like I nearly fainted like, oh my gosh, who wants to go to Mount Everest? Like when you see these people on these like cliffs and they're like shoulder to shoulder. And I'm like, how many people like die every year on there? Yeah. Like, Same. it's just, it was crazy to me. Um, mm. So those are a couple that I know are super obvious, but like in terms of choosing where to go, like what other tips would you have for people on choosing places that are more sustainable destinations? Yeah. Um, so I think on the um, over tourism thing, because I feel like it's going to be more and more prevalent, the more of us that travel in the world, that is going to be a problem. Um, and I think, you know, you often get all these um, kind of lists of like, don't go to London, go to Nottingham instead. And you're like, hmm. Nottingham's nice, but it's not London. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, um, and, and you know, you get a lot of those lists coming out. Um, so I think, you know, you can go places that are talked about um, being quite over-touristed, like even Machu Picchu. You can find ways of doing them that have less of an impact on the environment and, and you avoid the crowded elements. So I think more and more travel companies now are kind of doing alternative routes up to certain mountains. So you might do kind of a longer travel trek like on totally different mountain paths to the one that kind of all the tourists do so I think it's definitely worth it if there's somewhere you really want to go it's worth exploring okay what's the like least crowded way of, of going there 
Um, and the same in cities, like often in cities, tourists all crowd to like a few sites, which actually, if you live in the city, you wouldn't spend any of your time there. So it's just kind of working out, OK, maybe I could go and see a few of those, but then spend more time in kind of neighborhoods a bit a bit further out. Um, in terms of choosing sustainable um, destinations to go to, so there's a whole chapter of the book about um, how to have kind of regenerative travel experiences. So where can you really make your travel count? So yeah, unfortunately, getting on a plane does um, mean that it's going to be a big chunk of our carbon emissions um, in our in our year or in our lifetime. Um, so how do we really make that count? And so you can find places that really kind of need tourists. So it might be certain destinations. Um, like, for example, Guyana in um, South America, the kind of tourist board have committed to very much community run and led travel experiences. So by going there, you know that your money is staying with local people. Um, and you also know that your money is helping local people to protect their environment. Um, so I, th I think looking for examples like that. Um, and, and that can that can be the same in cities as well. So, for example, um, in Slovenia, Ljubljana, the capital, has a really, really strong um, green ethos and they do loads of zoning things so that um, visitors um, certain parts of the city have been totally pedestrianized. So kind of it makes it actually uh, a nice environment for people who live there as well as visitors. Um, all of their transport is green. Um, their infrastructure is totally um, sustainable. Um, so they've kind of made sure that um, the visitors and, des and the people who live there are kind of benefiting alongside one another. Um, so there's loads of different ways um, of kind of picking where we go. I think with the kind of quandary of the climate crisis and carbon emissions and traveling, um, for me, kind of trying to travel places where I know my money is contributing to conservation to some extent. So if I know that by staying on a certain farm, that's helping that farmer to kind of rewild a certain chunk of his land um, rather than intensely farm it. Um, to me, that feels like a really positive way I can spend my money. I noticed you also have a section in the book about when to travel, which I admit that is not something I ever thought of as being a decision about sustainability. I just kind of think of the weather and the crowds, you know, like I want to try to find that happy yeah. medium when the weather is not bad, but there's the crowds are not huge. Yeah. So how does sustainability play into your decision about when to travel? Yeah, sure. So there's two things. So one is um, going back to the over tourism point. So um, if a city like Barcelona is at kind of 500 percent capacity in um, August, um, but actually has very few visitors in January, it's kind of thinking, well, OK, yeah, we, we all want to go and sit and have tapas in the sunshine in summer in Barcelona. But um, I've been to Barcelona in January and actually it's a totally different experience, but it's kind of as valid a one. It's kind of, you know, the old, ancient, misty, cobbled streets and you kind of cozy up around tapas rather than necessarily sitting out in squares. Um, obviously, that's quite an extreme example, but I think it's just thinking to try and avoid the peak times. Um, so that's from a kind of over tourism perspective, but that also really helps destinations um, economically as well. So the destinations where there tends to be a kind of slight conflict with tourism is where they might only make money from tourists for half the year. And so therefore they need to kind of get a load of staff that maybe come from somewhere totally different to work. So actually local people aren't necessarily benefiting from those jobs. Um, so that's not a very kind of sustainable economic model. It's, you know, so I think in, in Africa, they call it the green season um, where it's kind of going during the rainier season, where it is trickier to see wildlife, but at the same time, you've kind of got everything growing up around you and there's there's different ways you can experience that destination. And it's helping to kind of fill a bit of a, a gap where there's not any economic activity at that time of year. Um, so yeah, so definitely something worth thinking about. I think for your experience as well. Um, sometimes it's really nice being kind of the only tourist around because you're treated a bit more special than when everywhere is just overrun. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's funny you use Barcelona in January as an example because I've been there in January <laughs> and I loved it. It it did not feel um, crowded at all. It seemed like a mm. wonderful city. 
And I kind of felt like we were, there were not a lot of tourists because everybody was running around in these heavy winter coats Yeah, because it was in the fifties and we're from Illinois and we're like, wow, it's so warm. This is awesome. <laughs> it's like spring. Yeah. And so uh, we thought it was fantastic. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to how to get to a place, um, we've already talked about the fact that air travel is not very um, friendly to the environment and container ships are an awesome option that I want to check out. <laughs> Yeah. Um, what's another really good option for an eco-friendly mode of travel? Sure. So um, I should probably caveat that container ships in themselves aren't very sustainable. <laughs> I often get pulled up on this. Um, but obviously you're, you're, you're hitching a ride on a boat that's already going. So you're not the one causing the emissions there. So I think we can justify that. So for me and the trip that we did really prove this is that a lot of sustainable travel is really about going a little bit slower. Um, and so it's all the slower modes of transport that are better for the environment it tends to be the slower you go the better it is in terms of your um, carbon footprint um and also i think it um it really helps you to kind of um delve a bit deeper into a destination as well so if you slowly travel through somewhere you're much likely to have more touch points with its culture with its landscape and kind of a more meaningful way than if we kind of carry on doing this slight tendency of like, right, I'm going to go to Europe. I want to tick off like all of these cities. I'm just going to whiz between them all, not really have any time to take in anything um, in between. Um, also traveling slowly does open up a bit more of a world of spontaneity, which I think is um, so important in travel. So you want to be able to have the time to be kind of take a detour um, or kind of be encouraged to go and see something that, a local might tell you about that isn't on your itinerary um so for me trains are probably um in europe in particular i love whizzing around on trains um and they're they're super green um much kind of green, much more sustainable than um driving or planes obviously um but um ferry travel as well um is always really interesting. And in, in lots of parts of the world, ferry travel is a very local way to get about um, and can often be much more um, rewarding in a way than jumping on a kind of boat trip for tourists. And then kind of on our trip, we absolutely loved cycling, walking, kayaking. Um, so as much as possible, kind of using on your own steam um, to really get to kind of understand the landscape and um, yeah. There are lots of options out there, but it's a bit harder to organize than jumping on a flight, unfortunately. <laughs> right. Yeah. The idea of traveling by train sounds like a lot of fun to me. I haven't done it very much, but it sounds fun. Like you, you get to go somewhere, you get to see the landscape as you're traveling, but you don't have to drive. So yeah. you can pay more attention to what the landscape is, has. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So if somebody wants to make an effort to travel more sustainably, what would you say is a good starting point for them? I think, first of all, it's daunting. There's lots to think about. And I think now all the time, if we're looking to make more kind of ethical, sustainable choices, we're getting bombarded with information all the time. Um, so I think kind of taking a step back from all that is quite important and really just thinking about um, the kind of incremental smaller things that we can do to make a difference. So when it comes to travel, some of the things that I kind of live by are um, trying to travel less, but for longer. So I know that the getting somewhere is the thing that um, really uses up all the carbon emissions and that has the most negative impact on my traveling. Yeah, so I try to just fly once a year um, and kind of really make it count whether that's um, short haul or long haul. Um, so I think we all maybe need to get a little bit more in the habit of doing that rather than this like kind of six big holidays a year um, flying all over the place. It's like really thinking about um, how and when we're flying. Um, another thing that you can do is fly direct um, that produces a lot less carbon emissions. Um, also kind of once you get somewhere, make sure that you're not flying within the destination. So maybe fly somewhere and then use train and buses and um, other ways to get around. Um, 
I then like to think about um, kind of who I'm spending my money with is a massive one. So I really want to scrutinize and understand where my money is going. So if I'm using a tour operator, I will ask them, I'll say, okay, so what percentage of my money is going to stay in this destination? Um, who owns all the lodges or hotels or little B&Bs that I'm staying in? Um, are they owned by local people or are they owned by a big international um, group? Um, and then kind of in the destination itself, I think it's just always thinking about the same thing. Like the biggest one is where you're spending your money um, and, and what people are, are doing with that. I think as kind of tourists, the biggest impact is um, our tourist pound or dollars, what that ends up doing in the destination that we're, we're traveling to. I think that is an excellent summary of what somebody can do to get started and um, not feel so overwhelmed with this. So again, the book is Sustainable Travel, The Essential Guide to Positive Impact Adventures. Love the fact that you have adventures in the title of the book. So people can buy that, of course, at any of their bookstores, local bookstores. If they don't have it, ask them to order it because it is available through um, a major publisher. And where can people find you online, Holly? Um, so I've got a website, just hollytuffman.com, which is just all my journalist work that I've done. There's a little bit about the book on there. Um, I'm also on um, Instagram, Twitter, just Holly Tuffin, you'll find me. Um, and do a lot of writing. So um, I guess look out for articles. But yeah, I really hope people buy the book as a, as a bit of a guide to how we can all think a bit more mindfully about how we travel and get out there and have adventures when we can. Yeah, and it is an absolutely gorgeous book. As you can imagine, it is full of lots of color photographs that are just stunning. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me.